Good morning and welcome to session one in the science strand of high school climate change symposium, Coral Reefs Severely Threatened Ecosystems. This session is being recorded. Our speaker for this session is Professor Emeritus Richard Hill from Michigan State University. Professor, professor Hill spent most of his career as a biology professor at Michigan State University, where he worked hard to be a good teacher as well as a productive researcher. During many summers, he also was a guest investigator at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. He's carried out original research on coral reef ecosystems in the Caribbean Sea and both the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Dr. Hill did his undergraduate studies at University of Delaware and his graduate studies at the University of Michigan. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your knowledge with us, Professor Hill. The floor is yours. Well, thanks, Lucas, and hi, everybody. I'm really pleased to be involved in this conference, and I really enjoyed the first session, uh, and congratulations to the two presenters for doing such a great job on, on what turned out to be short notice. Um, I want to talk to you this morning about coral reefs, and uh, the subtitle is Severely Threatened Ecosystems, and I thought first I would pop up a substitute title warm water coral reefs, because it turns out that there is actually coral reefs, some even in the deep sea, in cold, dark water. But all the only reefs that I'm going to be talking about are the ones in sunlit warm waters. The, the ones in the colder water have their own problems. It's not like they have no problems, but it's a different set of problems. And the second thing I want to focus on is the subtitle, Severely Threatened Ecosystems, because the coral reefs create a setting for ecosystems that are teeming with life. So I want to just take a look at that to begin with, that here's a coral reef and the corals, um, most, most of what you see there in the structural background, all these organisms here and here, they're all corals what we call reef building corals. And they build this structure. And of course they're alive and they're metabolizing and they're producing materials and so forth. But then this becomes the context for many other kinds of organisms, uh, both plant and animal. Here you can see all the fish. And here's a photo just showing that there's many kinds of corals. So the coral reef ecosystems include not only many organisms besides corals, but also a great diversity of corals themselves. There are about, there, there's about 800, worldwide, there's about 800 species today of uh, reef building warm water corals that build all the warm water reefs around the earth. Um, I've just put in a few photos here of the different shapes of the corals. The, in the, within the diversity of corals. These are all corals and they have many different shapes and sizes. And of course they provide a home for fish. Um, people figure there's something over 30,000 species of fish alive in the world today. And uh, about a third of those depend on coral reefs. So a big part of the, a big fraction of the fish alive and they're very numerous organisms, uh, is dependent on coral reefs. Just a few more photos of fish. The idea here is to think about this as an ecosystem with a place to live, which is occupied by many different types of organisms. These are barracudas swimming through a reef. You occasionally see sharks on the reefs. I'm sure they're often there because there's so many other fish that they can prey on. And then there's organisms besides the, the corals and the fish. Cuttlefish, the soft corals, these are ones that don't build a, a hard stony skeleton, but they're still in the same coral family, so to speak. Um, and there's many soft corals. It's really common to see sea turtles. Of course, they're holding their breath when you see them in the, in the reef. The giant clams, this next slide will just show you how giant some of them are. 
they occur only in coral reef ecosystems. So if the coral reef ecosystems get in trouble, the, the giant clams, the biggest of them are about three feet long. Um, if the coral reefs get in trouble, the giant clams get in trouble too, because they are obligatorily tied to the reef ecosystem. So again, the big point to stress so far is that these reefs are teeming with life. Biologists use a little bit more formal terminology. We call them hot spots of biodiversity. And so when we talk about the stresses and so forth of, car of the corals themselves, uh, we're talking about the, the, uh, the foundation of a system that many other kinds of organisms depend on. So let's talk a little bit about the nature of corals. This is a, a microscopic image, so it's blown up, of a surface of a, of a coral, of a reef building coral. And you can see that there's kind of the same, there's a repeated pattern here. And, and as we'll say, see in a second, that reflects a lot about how coral reefs develop. The, the corals are in a phylum, because we divide the animal kingdom into phyla. They're in a phylum that is sometimes called the selenerates and sometimes called the cnidarians. Um, and one of the major body forms among the selenerates and cnidarians is called a polyp. A polyp is shaped like this with a stalk and then a ring or cluster of tentacles at the at the top and it uses those tentacles to feed there's little stinging cells in the tentacles and as a as various other creatures little creatures swim by even sometimes little fish these um, tentacles can sting them and then they polyp this is this shape of organism is called a polyp, polyp. the polyp can eat the fish so here in Michigan, we have some selenerates living in the natural world or cnidarians in the shape of polyps. And that's the hydras that you can see. These are maybe a quarter of an inch, maybe as much as a half an inch high. But you can see they have the characteristic polyp shape. They have a stalk and they have a ring of tentacles at the top. And another group that's really familiar to us, although they don't occur in, in nature here in Michigan, are the sea anemones, which we see when we go to marine aquariums or home uh, hobbyists that have coral reef aquariums often have sea anemones in them. And this also is a selenerate or cnidarian. And, and you can see again, the stalk and the ring of tentacles. So now if we go back to the reef building corals, here is a, a quick drawing, it's not a very detailed drawing of the polyp of a reef building coral. And you can again see the stalk and, and the ring of tentacles. And you can see if we look down on this, if we look down on it from above, it would look like one of these. So here we are back to the microscopic image of, of a coral, of a reef building coral. And you can see that what we're seeing here are the tops of many polyps. So the, a coral actually, a reef building coral actually consists of many individual polyps. And uh, the polyps, some, in some species of corals, the polyps are less than one eighth of an inch in diameter, less than one eighth of an inch from one side to the other. Uh, in other species of corals at the other extreme, you get polyps that are a bit over a quarter of an inch. But you can basically think of these of these polyps in terms of their diameter being between an eighth and a quarter of an inch. So they're not the size of uh, regular sea anemones, but nonetheless, they're obviously polyps. And what happens then is that uh, corals, reef building corals reproduce sexually. They reproduce with eggs and sperm sometimes, um, and then they get started or they can get started asexually by simply sometimes just a, an older coral breaking and giving a rise to a new piece. But anyway, once a new coral gets started, whether it's by sexual reproduction or by asexual reproduction, uh, then the, the, car, the new coral grows by multiplication of its polyps. The polyps, each polyp can make buds, little outgrowths, 
which turn into new polyps. So once a coral gets started, however it gets started, it grows by asexual uh, replication of the polyps, which bud off new polyps. So now we'll look at some big corals. We, go, we typically call them corals, although they consist of many, many individual animals. So here's a large coral where you can actually see that it's made up of many, many polyps. And here's another large coral. This one, many of the corals, uh, the polyps pull in their tentacles during the daytime. And in this large coral, all the polyps, it's the middle of the day and they pulled in their tentacles. But you can again see graphically that, um, that the coral consists of many individual polyps. Here's a really big coral. That's actually me there. And you can see that this, this coral below me as I swam over, it was over 20 feet long. And we'll go down here to more to eye level. And this massive structure, um, a, a giant structure, 20 feet by maybe 15 feet, it's all made up of little polyps, countless polyps. And each polyp, maybe I'll just go back briefly and then we'll return to where we were. What happens is that each polyp in a reef building coral secretes around its, its base, around here, a little calcified cup. Um, so this, this polyp, if it's a coral polyp, it's secreting um, from about this level down and around the bottom and up the other side, a hard material made of calcium carbonate, a mineral material. It's usually called a, a, cal a calcium carbonate cup around its base. So in a coral like this, where you can see graphically that it has a skeleton that, the, that it, the, all the living tissue is growing on, that skeleton is the result of all the individual polyps making these little tiny cups around its bottom half, around its base. And those fuse with each other, all the polyp cups fuse with each other and other organisms help them glue together, so to speak. And that's what gives rise to the structure of a coral reef. It's a hard structure that's, that, that, that stands up out, off the bottom of the sea and that pr provides an excellent home for many kinds of fish and other animals as, we, as we've talked about. So that's kind of the nature of a coral reef up to a point. There's a lot more to talk about. So the next one I wanna do is start off with a little natural history, which is gonna lead us into a major uh, discovery, so to speak. Um, and this natural history comes by looking at how coral, corals are oriented when they're living in their natural settings. And if you ever get to, uh, if you've gone to coral reefs or you ever get to swim around on coral reefs, either snorkeling or scuba diving, if you look, carefully, if you're observant, you'll notice that a lot of the corals um, are very obviously growing to expose their tissue to the sunlight. See, so here we are in a reef, the sun's straight above, and, and, and this is an undersea slope. It's like a little hill or mountain. So down below us is the bottom, and up above is the, is the surface, which is parallel to the upper edge of this photo. And the sun is the sunlight is coming in from above like this, and you can you can see here's this coral coral growing on this slope, but instead of growing up straight up from the slope and kind of pointing off to the upper right, instead it's growing in sheets that grow out so that they're parallel to the sea surface, and these sheets are directly in, the the sunlight hits them directly. And you see this pattern really common, commonly in the natural history of coral reefs, that the corals grow in ways that they expose their body as much as they can to the sunlight that's coming down from the sea surface. Here's another coral on a sloping bottom, but it's growing out in a way that it's, it's, it's most of its body is parallel to the surface rather than parallel to the sea bottom. Um, here's a coral, uh, a big coral, 
and or, or often called a table coral. And you can see very graphically here, again, the sea surface is above us here, but it's parallel with the upper frame. And, uh, and so again, this coral is growing in a way that's parallel to the sea surface and, and, uh, and cap actually, here's another, here's a beautiful image of a, this, this coral was about 10 feet across. It was a really big table coral. Now, if you really look at this, you notice that it resembles something that we're, we, most of us tend to be more familiar with. And you look at the shape of this coral, it's very similar to the shape of this tree. So the, and here they are together in totally different environments. The tree is of course on land growing like a tree with a trunk and leaves and everything. The coral is under the water. It has this, this pedestal that consists of a stony skeleton. And then it has this huge colony of coral polyps that have made the skeleton that they're living in. But they have the same shape. And the reason is that corals, the reef, the warm water reef building corals are photosynthetic organisms. So we tend to think of them as animals, but they are photosynthetic. They have to have to be healthy, they have to have sunlight and they are absolutely dependent on sunlight for, for to have a long life, a long healthy life. And we'll say more about that as we go. So now if we go back and look a little bit again at the, the kind of the microscopic structure of corals and we look again at this polyp, you see what happens is that, the, that there's an inner layer here to the stalk of this and, and an inner layer on the inside of the tentacles that you can see, that's what I'm outlining here with the pointer. And in this inner layer of the polyp, as I've drawn it here where it is, there are algal cells living inside the coral cells. And there's great numbers of these algal cells. They belong to a group of algae called the dinoflagellates. And so basically a warm water reef building coral is an animal algal symbiosis. It's not simply an animal. It's an animal that lives symbiotically, that is closely together in a way that they each depend on each other. It lives uh, symbiotically with these algal cells and the algal cells carry out photosynthesis and by photosynthesis, they make their sugars and other amino acids and other products of photosynthesis, and they share these products, the sugars, amino acids, all these things that they make, they share with the animal part, with the animal, the animal part of the polyp. So all of these uh, polyps here, all of them are loaded with the symbiotic algae. And when corals grow, they grow in ways that present these polyps to the sunlight coming down so that the it's symbiotic algae, so that the symbiotic algae get the sunlight that they need. So just to reiterate what we were saying before, here we're looking at a set of corals. These are, there's probably about six different species of corals on this particular part of reef. They all, you can see, are exposed one way or another to the sunlight coming down from the surface. Here is one that's growing in that kind of table shape that we've seen already. And we're reminded, as soon as we think about it, that it's growing in the same shape as an acacia tree on the, on the savanna of Africa. And the reason, again, is that they both require sunlight. They both depend on photosynthesis to be healthy. In the case of the tree, it's inherently photosynthetic. In the case of the coral, <clears throat> it's evolved to have a symbiotic relationship to uh, photosynthetic algae that it now depends completely on. See? So that's a bit of background. So now I want to talk about another theme that you'll see we'll come back to. It's a very relevant theme for talking about corals. We think of evolution as producing adaptations for everything. Over millions of years, we can also, even as a professional biologist, I can find myself thinking that evolution is uh, all powerful in the sense that it can produce almost anything we can imagine. And, and just to explore that briefly, let's just talk about temperature for a bit. Here's, here's two parts of the world's ocean. Here's a tropical lagoon. 
I think I actually took this photo in, uh, in Hawaii, if I remember. But the water here might be 30 degrees centigrade. And, and, and I'm always giving you the Fahrenheit equivalents. Uh, now, if instead we go another part of the world's ocean, the ocean around Antarctica, now the water is at minus two degrees, the liquid water is at minus two degrees all year long in the ocean around Antarctica. Uh, because it has salt in it, it's seawater, it, it goes a little below freezing and still stays water. It goes a little, I shouldn't say, shouldn't have put it that way. It goes a little below zero degrees centigrade. It goes a little below the freezing temperature, but doesn't freeze because of the salt. So mostly this water is water unfrozen at minus two degrees. The big point is you have seawater now on a single world ocean that in some places is at plus 30 and other places minus two. And the amazing thing is there's fish living everywhere. There's huge numbers of fish as we've seen living in the warm waters of tropical reefs. And there's huge, actually huge numbers of fish living in the minus two water of Antarctica. These are fish of a species that lives in Antarctica. And what you're seeing here above and below is ice. So these are living in the unfrozen seawater in among ice in the ocean off of Antarctica. And you might think that these fish would all be little tiny things moving around in slow motion. Actually, they're very productive fish, the ones that live at these cold temperatures in Antarctica. They're so productive that they provide, so to speak, half the food for all the penguins and seals. We often see photos of penguins and seals in Antarctica and how numerous they are. And, and that's very impressive. But we, then if you take a step back and you say, but what are all these penguins and seals eating? Well, they're eating a variety of things, but at least half of what they're eating is fish. And so these fish themselves must be capable of growing and reproducing it well, uh, vigorously, if they're gonna provide all that food. So whether you go in the tropics or you go in the Arctic, you find fish, which then gives us this impression that evolution can, can, can come up with a solution to any challenge, any temperature. Here's again, tropical and, Ar and Antarctic water. We go to the tropical water, we see these sea stars and sea urchins everywhere in coral reefs. If we go down to the sea around Antarctica, here again, uh, great numbers of sea urchins and sea stars. Here we're under the Antarctic ice sheet and all this white here is ice ice crystals oftentimes. Again, if you look at the tropical versus the Antarctic Sea, if you go into the coral reefs, you're, there's often times that you'll see great numbers of warm water sea anemones, and, and yet you go to the Antarctic Sea and you see sea anemones living in water that's temperature below zero. So evolution has allowed these groups of animals, fish, and uh, sea urchins and anemones to diversify in all the waters of the earth. It seems to be able to, um, to um, um, come up with this, uh, almost any kind of diversification. But we think of evolution as producing adaptations for everything, but there are exceptions. And I thought I'd start with talking about a, um, um, let me, Lucas, what, how, what's our time? It is 10.53 currently. Uh, but I should say, how much longer? It goes to, there is a half hour left. Oh, really? A half hour? Oh, good. Okay. I wanted to check just so I can pace this correctly. Okay. Thanks a lot, Lucas. So back to where we were, we think of evolution as producing adaptations for everything. And we've just kind of seen um, the, um, the diversification across all the temperature of the earth, but there are exceptions. And I wanna start with an exception that's closer to home than talking about coral reefs. And this is, well, here we're gonna look at another marine animal and group of animals, these are dolphins and uh, swimming in the ocean. And uh, I'm gonna be talking about dolphins and I'm gonna be talking about whales and seals. And all of them, all, all mammals are actually alive today face the problem that when in the males of mammals alive today, if you look at the male gonads, the testes, 
they have a limited ability to live in high temperatures. So for most mammals alive on earth today, the temperature in the abdomen, in the abdomen of the animal is 37 degrees centigrade, which is about 99 degrees Fahrenheit. But the testes, the male gonads, they require, they, they can't be any warmer than 35 degrees centigrade. They, they, they have to be a couple degrees cooler than the normal abdominal temperature, and that's 95 degrees Fahrenheit, in order to make sperm and make testosterone and do the things that they need to do. So this is a case where evolution hasn't come up with just anything and everything. When you, for, evolution has been going on for millions of years, and when we think about all the organs in our bodies, the heart, the um, stomach, the liver, the kidneys, all of these organs I've just mentioned, all of them function when they're in our innards like this, in our abdomen or thorax, they're all at 37 degrees. They're all functioning at this temperature, this relatively warm temperature that we maintain in our abdomen. But after millions of years of evolution, th these other organs, the um, testes, they cannot function properly if their temperature is above 35 degrees centigrade. So when you look at the marine mammals that I've talked about already, like this dolphin or the whales or the seals, in all of them, the testes are where? They're in the abdominal cavity. So that's the position. So here are these organs that cannot function correctly above 35, but they're living in a body cavity that it's 37, and where all the other organs over evolutionary time have, are, have gotten to just do fine. They are 37 and they function fine, but there's, some, there's been some limit and no one knows what it is but there's been some reason where evolution was not able to come up with changes which would allow the testes to function at 37. So how do the dolphins, seals, and whales uh, deal with this problem? This, and the way they have evolved to deal with it is kind of elaborate. And again, they wouldn't have to have any of this that I'm about to describe if the testes simply had evolved to, to be able to function at 37, but they haven't. And so therefore this elaborate system is required. So it's, a, it's a largely a vascular system. It's largely something to do with the blood vessels. So here's a sketch of the heart. And next I wanna show you the arteries that carry blood from the heart to the testes. And so here's the heart. And what the heart does is it pumps arterial blood through, a ves through vessels that run along the back to, to the back of the dolphin's body. And along to the puzzle that I wanna introduce is that there's veins intermingled among these arteries. So now we're looking at other blood vessels, venous blood vessels, and these are carrying blood back to the heart. The arteries are carrying blood from the heart. The veins are carrying back to the heart. But you can see these veins run along, there's a vein running along parallel to each of these arteries. So the veins have many pieces that run right next to the arteries. And, and this is what biologists call a, call a countercurrent vascular system because you've got blood flowing in opposite directions, thus countercurrent within a certain system. And then the final piece of the puzzle is to say, well, where does the blood come from that is flowing in the veins? The, ve the arterial blood is coming from the heart. Where's this venous blood coming from? And that it turns out is coming from the tail flaps they're typically called, they're, they're more formally called the flukes, the tail uh, uh, fins or flap of the dolphin or the whale, or they can come from uh, similar parts in seals. So this venous blood here, it, in this, these thin parts of the body, the venous blood as it flows through these, it's cooled a little bit, kind of like when blood flows through our fingers, it gets cooled a little bit. 
Then that cool venous blood comes to this counter current system where the individual veins are flowing along with cool venous blood right next to the arterial blood that's flowing towards the testis. And what happens is this allows the arterial blood before it actually enters to be cooled by two degrees. So that it then keeps the testis two degrees cooler than everything else in the abdomen which is a necessity given that evolution has not produced a testis which can function at an abdominal temperature. And, and before I leave that, now I'll just say in, 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 uh, briefly in passing that of course we all know that on land what uh, virtually all mammals have done in their evolution is to exteriorize the testes. They're not in the abdomen anymore so that they can be a little bit cooler. But of course that increases the risk of, of uh, being injured. But that's all done to keep the testes a little cooler. So now we're back to the theme we were at. We think of evolution as producing adaptations for everything. And how does all that everything I've been saying to you in the last five minutes relate to Carl's? Well, here we're gonna face another case. Whereas where, where a phenomenon that we find kind of paradoxical, the way we usually think, the way even biologists think about it, evolution, but a paradoxical state of affairs where there seems to have been over the millions of years that evolution's had to produce adaptations and so forth, there seems to have been some limit to what evolution was capable of doing. And this is the root of the problem that one of the biggest problems that Carl's have today. Carl's made the cover of Science Magazine a few years ago, Reefs in Trouble. And the way they're in trouble, one of the principal ways they're in trouble is that it is a product of one of these limits on what evolution is capable of. And this deals with the symbiotic algae. You remember that the corals have algal symbionts. They depend on them. Their health depends on them. They need to be photosynthesizing uh, in their bodies. And as a result, corals grow in ways that they can get lots of sunlight. Um, and we've seen how these are really crucial aspects of the biology of corals. Well, back to a thermometer. Um, the symbiosis between um, uh, the corals, the animal part, the coral polyps, and the algae fails at a certain high temperature. So when a coral gets to a, a high temperature, and I'm going to say more about which high temperature, the symbiosis fails. It takes a lot. We don't know much about it, but we know that there's got to be a lot of communication between the animal part of a coral and the algal part for them to continue to live together as a working symbiosis. And that symbiosis fails if the organism becomes too warm. Now, what this thermometer shows is we can look back over the history of the ocean over the last centuries and, and uh, 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 millennia, recent times, however, recent times, hundreds, hundreds of years in the recent past. And we can say each summer, how, how warm have the waters gotten in the coral reef areas? And we can average that. And we can say, what's the historical average for the high summer temperature in the places where reefs uh, uh, lived? And failure temperature for the symbiosis is higher. So historically, the, the waters haven't gotten high enough to break up the symbiosis. But the difference here is only one to two to at most three degrees centigrade. So for some reason in their evolution, the reef building corals, they've developed this crucial symbiosis, but the temperature of this, that, that the symbiosis requires to be stable, the highest temperature that the, the symbiosis, can symbiosis can tolerate and still be stable is only one or two degrees above the high summer temperatures that have been existing for centuries. So you can see then when global warming started a few decades ago, and all of a sudden the temperature of the ocean started rising above the historical norms, the corals were only a, a one or they only had a buffer of one or two degrees centigrade of safety. 
And so as soon as this ocean started warming in the recent warming events, this ocean temperature got to be higher than the failure temperature of the symbiosis. And that's the cause of what we call bleaching. When, they, when the symbiosis becomes too warm, the corals lose their symbionts. So here's a coral, an individual coral. You can see on this side, the coral is kind of an olive color. That color is principally from the algal symbionts. See, for, so for this particular coral, this side of it is still healthy and full of the algal symbiont. But this side has been exposed to temperatures that are too high. And again, that only takes a degree or two or three above the traditional norms because of the nature of corals, they've been, this part of the coral experienced high temperatures long enough that all the symbionts left. So even though there's still living tissue here, the symbionts aren't there. And so it doesn't have the characteristic color of the algae. It doesn't have the algae. It's not photosynthesizing and all of those things that the algae do. And as I've said before, this is what bleaching means. So just to illustrate why bleaching matters, one of the first major bleaching events of recent times was in the Galapagos Islands. And I'm gonna speed along a little bit here as I'm watching time. But the Galapagos is in fairly warm parts of the ocean. And every now and then, because of El Nino, uh, the Galapagos are one of the places where El Nino has its biggest effects. Every now and then you get a, a peak in temperature. That's what these red things are through time from 1950 to almost the present. These are times that the waters in the Galapagos area became high. Well, in 1982-3, there was this very high peak. You can see it was higher than anything before it. And that's because of global warming. Already by 82, 83, the global warming created situations where one of these peaks got much higher than ever before. And what that did was to create this huge amount of warm water around. This is where the Galapagos Islands are. And this is this huge area of very warm water around the Galapagos Islands. And what that did was to basically bleach all the corals. And sometimes when corals are bleached, they can recover from it. They can get the symbionts back again, but sometimes not. And if they don't get the symbionts back, they gradually lose their health and die. So what happened in the Galapagos is that the corals were bleached because of that warm water event. And eventually virtually all of them died. 90 to 95% of the corals in the Galapagos Islands were destroyed by that one event and they've not recovered to this day fully. So this is a kind of a model of what bleaching can do and why reefs are in trouble. So by now, as you know from reading the news, there's regular bleaching events. This is a plot of the global sea surface temperature uh, starting in 1860 and ending almost today. And if we go from 1982-83, when that first big bleaching event in the Galapagos, and we look at what's been happening since then, you can see that globally, the surface temperature of the ocean has just been going up, up, up. So that by now, there are bleaching events regularly. And these have been really severely striking places like the Great Barrier Reef, the reefs of Micronesia, uh, again, the Galapagos, to the point that there's now places where there's bleaching as far as the eye can see. Briefly, I wanna mention one other stress that corals are under. And this is, the, or I should have, I forgot this slide. So what the options that corals have to deal with this are to move towards the earth's poles, move out of the tropics where they can get cooler water or to get used to the higher temperatures that are causing the bleaching so they aren't bleached so much, or to evolve and improve tolerance of high temperatures. And scientists now are researching all of these to see if humans can aid uh, these kinds of changes that would be, be beneficial and so forth. And now very quickly, because I wanna leave most of the last five minutes for questions. Um, the other stress that corals are under, so. The so they're simultaneously under two stresses. And just like with human health, um, 
that's difficult for them. And it has to do with carbon dioxide. As we all know, the way we make soft drinks is by dissolving carbon dioxide into water. And one of the things that happens if you dissolve enough carbon dioxide into water is the water becomes somewhat acid. If you, if you drop a, the tooth that a child is lo loosened in a young child's mouth and come out, you drop it in Coca-Cola, over the ensuing weeks, the, carl, the, the tooth dissolves because of the acid. So what we know is that this is the plot of the atmospheric CO2 over the last uh, decades from 1960. And as we all know, CO2 is going up, up, up in the atmosphere. And, wh and what that's doing is it's causing seawater to have a higher amount of dissolved carbon dioxide. And that tends to dissolve the carbonate skeletons, uh, just like it dissolves teeth, the carbonate skeletons of corals. And it tends to make it harder for corals to make new skeletons. So as new polyps are made and they're trying to make their skeletons, it makes it harder for them to make the skeletons. So again, what are the options Carl ha Carl's have to um, av avoid this, uh, this stress on them? They can't move towards the poles to solve this problem because the whole world's ocean is becoming richer in carbon dioxide. But again, they can get more used to it and they can evolve. And scientists are looking at ways that these could be aided and abetted. The, the, the ultimate solution is to stop the rise in global CO2, as you'll talk about a lot more today, and as we've all, as the presenters earlier today already talked about. So there's the story on coral reef ecosystems and the biology of why they are threatened by the global change and the implications that has for them because they are very complex ecosystems and so many organisms depend on them. So I appreciate the chance to talk to you and I'd be glad to answer any questions. All right, looks like we got uh, a Q&A from someone saying, could you repeat the difference between evolution and acclimation? Sure, acclimation is something that an organism can do during its own lifespan. See, so um, most people, for example, are aware of um, that they feel too warm when the first days of summer come and Yet when summer really settles in, we're not so bothered by the heat. And there's actually reasons for that. For example, we become better able to sweat after we experience multiple day, warm days. So that you see, that's a change that we're capable of undergoing within our own lives. So we have flexibility within our own lives of what we can do. Uh, evolution is something that occurs from one generation to the next. So, so it involves genetic, potential genetic changes. During evolution, you could have new genes uh, coming into play that might provide new capabilities. All right, thanks so much. I know this is kind of a big question. Someone else is asking, what are the steps we can take to help save the coral reefs? Well, actually, after listening to the presenters this morning, I, um, uh, added this one slide because I thought this could really come up. And so I just added this very hurriedly. But if you think about us as kind of doctors all over the world, doctors and nurses, trying to look after the health of the corals, because like with all organisms, as they face these stresses, they're going to do better if they're healthy. And um, and so one thing uh, we can do as, as we'll help all of the global chain is to try to stop the rise in global CO2. That will, that will make it much easier for them to calcify, to make their skeletons, to have their, the structures they need. It'll aid the health. But there's many other things that we can do to help their health. You can see because corals are photosynthetic, anything that clouds their water 
undermines their health, their basic ability to be healthy and respond to stress productively. So for example, erosion, when new golf courses are made and new roads are put in along coastlines and uh, soil erosion occurs and makes the water uh, uh, get cloudy. The more we can stop that, the healthier the corals will be. Fertilizer runoff, when fertilizers from agriculture go into the coral seas, uh, they make the water become more turbid, more cloudy. That interferes with health. Anything that increases water cloudiness. And one other quick thing that everybody can do, I hope you all get to go snorkeling or scuba diving. But one of the key things is to become proficient enough at diving that you can float above the reef. Many beginners uh, stand on the reefs or they're kicking their fins and they break off pieces of reef. And so one of the keys there before this big adventure starts is to become proficient enough diver that you can be neutrally buoyant and you can float above and kind of float over like a, like a helium all around the world. And a lot of the people doing it learn to dive like three days before. And they are not really prepared to dive in a way that maintains the coral health. All right, we got a lot of questions. This is good. People are loving the talk. It's really, really great. Does the increase in water temperature change the amount of carbon dioxide that, the, that can dissolve into the water? Mm, that's a really good question. And the answer is yes, it does. Um, so, but then you get into a complex physical chemical relationship where you have then both effects of how much carbon dioxide is in the water and then how that reacts with the components of the water. And actually, I wouldn't want to give a quick answer to that, but certainly the increasing temperature allows more CO2 to dissolve in the water. All right, and this one's more specific to us here in the upper Midwest, but is there aquatic life in the Great Lakes that are affected by climate change in a similar way as coral in the oceans? Uh, well, we don't have calcifying um, so much. I mean, there are clams and so forth, and I don't know what they're doing in the Great Lakes. But, but the Great Lakes, I think the big thing to say is we don't have coral reefs in the Great Lakes or anything that's really analogous where you have formation of carbonate from the carbon dioxide. But there are many other effects of increasing CO2 in the oceans. Uh, here we're just talking about the impacts of increasing CO2 on particular organisms, the reefs. But they, the, the increasing acidity of the ocean, the increasing CO2 and acidity is affecting larval fish. It's affecting the smell of adult fish in some cases so that the fish cannot detect the odors they need to, to travel where they need to travel. Um, so there's many, many effects of the CO2 and acidity rise in the ocean. And those would apply in many cases equally to the Great Lakes. Right, fantastic. Another question coming in. Um, so are algae photosynthetic, but the polyps themselves carnivorous? Ah, well, the algae, see the, 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 the corals, a, poly, a healthy coral polyp is, you know, in, bi in biology, we learn that organ some organisms are herbivores. They, 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 they uh, I'm sorry, some, some, some organisms are photosynthetic, right? And, and then and they make their own food. And some of them are herbivores. They eat leaves and other things that are pr produced by photosynthesis. And others are carnivores. They eat animals. The thing, one interesting thing about coral polyps is they're all of them. They're photosynthetic because they have the algae. With their tentacles, they catch algal cells that are loose in the water. So then they're acting like herbivores and they can catch little animals. So then they're carnivores. So they're eating at all these levels, all, their, all these levels when they're healthy. All right, wonderful. Uh, now this one, they're saying keep it brief, but can you briefly discuss the research you did in the Caribbean and Indian Sea? Yeah, what I did uh, was kind of a, a looking, I was trying to break open a new research frontier. Um, there are, 
chemical compounds that are called betaines. It's spelled B-E-T-A-I-N-E-S. Uh, and it's a big name for a pretty simple thing. They're just amino acids that have methyl groups on them. And betaines are a really important group of compounds in land plants to resist damage. See, sunlight can actually damage even plants. In a, in, a, in a loose way, we could say sunlight can even sunburn plants. Sunlight can interfere with photosynthesis because as we all know, we can burn from it, we can be hurt by it. And in the same way, plants can be hurt by it. So for a plant like a tree out in your yard, it's using the sunlight productively for photosynthesis, but it also it has to resist the damage that the sunlight might cause it. And land plants use betaines as a major part of their defense. And so what I was doing for the last five, six, seven years of my research career was looking for betaines in corals and other reef animals so that we would know if these same compounds that are involved on land and resisting the damage that photons can cause are also involved in coral. And the bottom line is that corals have many, many betaines at high concentrations. And so now the next step is gonna to be to find out if they, these are actually functioning as uh, uh, photon defenses against photon stress in, in corals. And then if they are, we could manipulate that to help combat potentially the problems that corals are having these days. So it's a long shot. It's, a, it's, a, it's the long game of trying to get the basics for uh, a line of, of uh, help to the corals that might prove out long-term. Fantastic. I know we only got a couple minutes left. So in the chat, people are asking, this goes back to the acclimation question. What would the acclimation of coral reefs look like? Well, we know for a fact that corals um, can become, they're not, they're not completely passive when they're confronted with the stresses we're talking about. That is, um, for example, one line of thought is that, and I, I wanna stress that a lot of these things I'm talking about are pretty complicated because different corals act in different ways. So there, again, there's 800 species of corals. They don't all behave in the same ways, but some corals we know switch the type of algae they have when they're under heat stress. So this is just one example. So these algae, they're all considered one very, very closely related group. Until 10 years ago, they were thought to be one species, but there's many different varieties of algae. And some of the corals, when they get under these stresses, the heat stress particularly, they get rid of the algae, the variety of algae they have, and they get and they take in a different one where the alga is more tolerant to heat. The symbiosis is more stable. See, so that's one example that if you wouldn't see this with your eyes, but if you analyze them, you realize that they're different weeks or months after they've started to experience heat stress than they were before biochemically and so forth. And in the way, exact ways they're carrying out photosynthesis. We only got like one minute left, but have we seen any evidence of reef, reef health improving during the pandemic because of less intrusion by humans? That's a really good question. And you know, when I got, the, I, you might have noticed when I showed you the CO2 plot, um, that's right to this month. You can go to NOAA and get the latest CO2 plot. And I remember like the minute before I clicked to it, I was wondering, all right, am I gonna see a change in the rise in CO, global CO2 because of the pandemic? And it isn't highly visible, right? I don't think we know enough yet um, to know if there's been a change. Many of the things we can measure on corals, like for example, the stability of the symbiosis, they take time just to do the measurements. Um, to, first of all, you've got to get money. You have to apply for grant money. You have to get a team out into the coral reefs. So it may be a year before we really have a good solid answer to that. All right, perfect. Lucas, you want to take over? Yep. Well, with that, we are out of time. Professor Hill, thank you so much for sharing your Saturday and your knowledge with us today. 
Session oh, two. Thank you. Session two begins at 11.35. You now have a 10 minute break before it starts. If you have any questions about how to get to your next session, let me know. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Hill.